Welcome back to DBL. We've talked a lot on the show about how to address school shootings. And right now we have a very special guest in the studio to discuss how he's involved in being a part of the solution. John Davis has a clinical master's degree in counseling psychology. He's been on the front line supporting victims of school shootings in Colorado, including Columbine and most recently the STEM school shooting. John is also behind the Two Extreme Foundation, which is a program that provides relationship based alternative therapy to troubled teens and their families struggling with emotional issues. John, uh, on behalf of everybody here at DBL, I want to thank you. Yeah, because I'll you You've really seen it all in the last 23 years of your work. In fact, you've counseled 14,000 adolescent young adult males, even treating teens who've said that they would shoot up schools. Uh, I want you to talk to our DBL Nation about a specific story that ended up with you in the back of a police car with a teen. Okay. So uh, many years ago, um, you know, one of the cool things in my job, actually, I should start with is the fact that uh, with this much time, I've been able to collaborate with so many different people. And so we were taking more of an inclusionary approach of involving as many people as possible. So there was a young man um, who had threatened to pull off a Columbine and he was a really hurt young man. So he's in the back of a police car. And so the police officer had to call it in to the chief investigating officer who said, hey, instead of us do doing it this way, why don't you call this therapist and connect with him and find out what this young man really needs. And that's really more of the approach that I think that we need to be taking today is to kind of slow down, stop reacting, stop acting out of emotion and respond to these young men. Um, that young man ended up being one of my dream team members, traveled with me out of the country, um, still have a relationship with him. He's one of our mentors. He still gives back. So really the police should have arrested him. He should have been expelled from school. I mean, that's what the, the law just states. Instead, we created a relationship with him and he is a thriving person in our community who gives back. That's incredible. That's that is that is absolutely incredible. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I just want to follow up. What do you believe the school's responsibility should be? That's a great question. We get hit a lot, which is, um, you know, it's a school's responsibility to be providing counseling for the kids. But at the bottom, the bottom line, let's let's choose some of our 5A type schools. You got 2000 students and five counselors. Thanks. That's 400 kids that they're supposed to be providing counseling, doing scheduling, taking care of all the testing. Looking and for red flags. All, all of it. Yeah, right. no, that, that is not the school's responsibility. The, the school is a frontline approach for us because they can identify and they can, you know, connect them with people like us who can provide the services. Wow. Uh, but at the same time, they also can be educating students in the classroom because at the end of the day, this is an everybody has to participate in this or this is going to continue to keep escalating. <sighs> So this is not stopping. It's only going to get worse unless everybody gets involved. Agreed. John, I have to ask you this because this isn't this isn't television. This isn't Dr. Phil. These sessions that you have with these kids can be very intense. I know that you've had your office trash. I know that you've been physically attacked. What makes you hang in there? Um, I get to do this every day. I mean, <laughs> I love my job. Um, I can see the emotion in your in your face. It's getting me emotional. You, <laughs> no, you care. No, I do. And speaking from parents on this panel, we need you. Thank you. Because I that. we are all fearful of our children going into these schools. Right. Um, I love what I do. Uh, I'm gifted at what I do. I did not learn in graduate school to be the man that I am for these young men. So I had good leaders in my life. I had solid mentors. I had people who spoke into my life. That's what I bring to the table. So uh, recently we had a young man that was uh, brand new to an intake who had just come from a hospital because he you know, said that he had suicidal ideation. So uh, people overreacted to the situation. I get that they need to be proactive in that situation, but the reaction did not help what was going on with him. So. 20 minutes into his intake, he jumped up, he cussed me out, went into the bathroom and trashed the bathroom. So I sat, at this point, I'm not afraid of any one of these young men. They do not evoke any type of fear inside of me. So for me, I waited him out, I waited three minutes, I walked in the bathroom, put my arm around him, said, we good? He said, we're good. I didn't say anything about him trashing the bathroom, came back in the office, finished the session, he's now doing treatment. Wow. Wow. What are some red flags that you think you look for, for parents, for people like us, in teenagers perhaps that might be a sign of 
something's going on. All right, let me use a little bit of humor first. Okay, so since you guys have young kids, okay, the Bible for you when you are expecting a I child, have that book. what to expect when you are expecting. We have what to expect in your first year. We have what to expect in your second year. Where is three, four, five, six, seven, and I can keep on going. Right. At wow. the end of the day, when these guys are in the early developmental stages, you are creating relationships with them and they need you. However, when you get to be fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they start separating from you, and so the pursuit changes. So what do you do? What do we do? We, you have to keep up with your kids. That is one of the most difficult things is there's a 30-year break in between when I was in high school and today. Parents are not educated as to what is going on in the schools. Parents have no idea. I mean, let, let's use nicotine. Let's use kids vaping. Uh, that blew on the scene. Do parents know that that is a neurotoxin? Do they know that that's going to affect them from a, a cardiovascular perspective or uh, even their sexual uh, development? Right. Most, most parents don't. So how do you keep up with that? You engage with your kids. You talk to your kids. But most parents fly through the flying seven questions, which is how was school today, right. and they get no answer. So yeah. it's being persistent. It's being proactive. It is not giving up on connecting with your kid no matter what. We are gonna, uh, can, can we hang on to you for the break? Sure. Because we are digital too, so stay with us on the break, but I do wanna plug uh, John's book. John, you have a book out now called Extreme Pursuit, which is all about helping teen boys face uphill battles on the road to becoming men of integrity. We thank you so much for being here. We need more people like you, and uh, awesome. honestly, you're doing so much for our, our youth. I salute you and I thank, thank you. you. Uh, stay with us in the break. Go to Daily Blast Live on YouTube and Facebook. We're gonna continue our conversation with John uh, right now. We'll be right back. The sun. So, okay, the, are we on? So the default questions are, how was your day? Yeah, how was school? So what, what should the questions be? Or like, what, how, like tell, give us some like, I mean, I have a two year old, so I don't know anything yet. So like. No, yeah, it, it's really about trying to evolve with your kids. And so it's staying connected with what is actually going on with them. So. The bottom line is what we see is that our, our guys are a targeted population. They're above average intelligent. They are emotional. Um, they have really deep feelings. They are Pied Pipers. I mean, they're so gifted. They're talented. I mean, my average SAT this year for my, se my seniors, 1290. So people think about mental health as that I work with a group of thugs. On paper, they look like thugs. Yeah. But guess what? They're some of the most amazing young men. Yeah. I have counseled pro athletes. I have current pro athletes. I have counseled senators, congressmen, doctors, lawyers, you name it. We have it. What do you do, here, because I have a young two-year-old and an eight-month-old, um, when I see stories like this weekly, yeah. I'm angry. He just said you it's going to get worse. Yeah, and you say like you want to you know, give them a hug and... The police gave them a break. Uh, mine's, my, my, my emotion is anger towards mm -hmm. these, to these individuals. Correct. What do I do to change how I feel about this whole situation and make things better on my end and for our, my community? So, great question. And that's a tough thing because this is what you don't learn in grad school is how to be able to connect with those that look unconnectable. So for me, it's being patient. It's waiting them out. It's finding a connecting point. We call it tying in. Because they're so screaming I can say, for love and attention. Yeah, they are. They're screaming. all I, they, They're all struggling. Oh. They're all self-medicating in a different way. Some oh. is anger. Some is drugs. Some is violence. Some is porn. Some is... I mean, the list goes on, and girls too. I mean, so this is a struggling generation. They are not connecting, and they are screaming to connect, but they're, they're connecting in the wrong ways. 